made it without too much stumbling. Yeah, you found it, didn't you? That's, hey, get off the there. <laughs> there you go. That's my trick. <laughs> well, cute story before I get started. And by the way, thank you, Alan, for that introduction. But uh, this morning, Cody and I went out for our walk. And uh, we're along a stretch of the neighborhood where the uh, no obstacles are in the walkway. And all of a sudden, Cody comes to a dead stop. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this? What is happening? I do all my troubleshooting techniques, you know, move the foot, do all this. And then this way, I suddenly hear three consecutive cat meows. <laughs> and, and Cody will not move. He's frozen. It sounds like the cat's coming a little bit closer to me. And then he sounds like he starts to step off the curb and cross the street and another meow and he's gone. Well, I think at that point, Cody was convinced he couldn't help the cat. So Cody promptly resumed our walk and we went on down the road and had a good time. This Saturday, uh, Sunday, October the 4th, officially marks my nine year anniversary as a guide dog owner. I've been blessed with two fabulous guide dogs over those years. The change that Willow and Cody have brought to my life is remarkable and still amazes me. But not only has that change been an impact on my life, but it's also been an impact on my family, my friends, and others in the community that I've met. Today, thanks to Cody, I can walk to my daughter's volleyball games and to my son's basketball games and Sierra will say, Dad, all my teammates turn to me and say, look, Sierra, here comes your dog with your dad. <laughs> and, and Kenny says, it's cool to see you walk into the basketball game, Daddy, but I'm not really watching you. Everybody else is telling me what's happening. And then, you know, thanks to Cody, I can enjoy breakfast or lunch with a friend or an acquaintance. And often my friends tell me, boy, Cody's so well behaved, I forgot he was under the table. And then thanks to Cody, you know, we can open the hearts and minds of others in the community that we meet. And I hear comments like, you know, your dog is so amazing. You know, he's such a good boy. I've been watching him walk you around. And then there's the somewhat perturbing comment of, there's a dog in here. And I just hope they're talking about Cody. <laughs> so, but it's not just us guide dog users who are making this big splash. <clears throat> it's you too. As donors, as volunteers, and as ambassadors, many of you are making a big splash as well. Without you, the job remains unfinished. So what I hope and what I wish for today is following today's program that we can, each and every one of us, deliver this message and pass it on wherever we live, wherever we work, and wherever we play, that guide dogs truly make a difference in the lives of visually impaired people all over this state and make a difference with their families, their friends, and in their own communities. Thank you all for being here today and please enjoy your lunch and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. Guide Dogs of Texas provides quality guide dogs to Texans who are visually impaired to increase their freedom, mobility, and independence. We do this work four paws and two feet at a time, but for every guide dog team, there are a hundred people behind the scenes, cheering them on, learning from their courage, and supporting their progress. Donors, volunteers, staff, friends, and family members are all essential parts of the guide dog community. Jennifer is a volunteer puppy raiser with Guide Dogs of Texas. With her is a puppy in training named Finn. 
I believe that Finn loves his job. You know, he gets to go with me everywhere. We have become so bonded. And on the very rare occasion that I'm not taking Finn with me and I'm leaving my house, it always kind of makes me sad a little bit when I look over at, over at him and he's looking up at me like, you're leaving without me? Um, so I think Finn really enjoys being out with me. He enjoys being out in public. He enjoys the attention and he's just the sweetest thing wherever we go. One of the beautiful things about the organization is that there are so many different roles um, for volunteers and uh, those roles also have a variety of different commitment levels because as we all know you know most of us are extremely busy so it's a beautiful thing you know you can do something as involved as this and something with a little bit less of a commitment level but no one role is any less important than the next because it, it truly takes a village. Marshall is an applicant for a guide dog from Guide Dogs of Texas. He was recently matched with guide dog Duncan. They've been together for only a few days and are learning how to work together with the help of a guide dog mobility instructor. I feel like my guide dog fits my personality. Uh, when I was on a matching interview and we went to take our first little our first little walk, he jumped up and was and was at attention and ready to go. And when we were back here in the house, he was ready to you know kind of chill and have fun. And so. He knows where business is business and pleasure is pleasure and uh, just the fact that he, I can tell that he's really amped to go and, and to be out and, do, and to do things, and that's exactly how I am. So I feel like he fits my personality very well. But some of the differences are is that, you know, when you're, when you're learning how to use a cane, you have to make all of the executive decisions as far as what's going to be the best route to go, how's it going to what's going to be the safest that way to do things and sometimes it can take a while to figure out those obstacles versus the dog um, can plan that out for you as you're coming up to it and uh, there's no surprises you uh, at least not yet uh, you can uh, you can pretty much rely on the dog to take you in, in, in the safest way possible I would tell somebody who's who's considering donating to guide dogs of Texas to think of it as an investment an investment in helping somebody further their independence within their community. I chose Guide Dogs of Texas to receive my guide dog for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, uh, the dogs are going to be trained in your uh, home environment uh, before you receive them. Uh, Texas has some, some harsh summers and, uh, and decent winters and in the north uh, where a lot of dogs are trained they don't necessarily have uh, harsh summers. I need I need a dog that's going to be able to uh, be able to, to travel in the conditions that I travel in, and I travel outside a lot. Uh, that was one that was one reason I went to Guide Dogs of Texas. Uh, the other one being is that whenever I did contact them, their uh, staff was real uh, professional and respectful to me and my needs. Um, when they came to do the uh, initial interview, it uh, I could tell that they. Uh, needed to gather all the information needed to make sure that they matched me with with the best dog and I, I am I'm glad that I did go with Guide Dogs of Texas. Guide Dog Dexter has graduated from the puppy program and is in advanced training. He has spent the last six months learning how to guide a blind person safely from a guide dog mobility instructor. While Bethany walks with her eyes closed with Dexter, Sarah teaches them how to communicate and move together, and gives Dexter valuable experience for when he's matched with a client. Guide dogs avoid obstacles and indicate overhead branches, curbs, and street crossings. They can find destinations like buses, benches, crosswalk buttons, and more. Guide dogs in training learn to ignore even exciting distractions in the environment.
Gary and guide dog Callie are a team who graduated together about six months ago. It can sometimes take up to a year for a white cane user to adjust to navigating with a guide dog. Let's hear what Gary has to say. Callie really shined on my last ski trip that I went on. There were about 350 uh, disabled veterans there and I don't know how many guide dogs and a lot of wheelchairs and she really got me through all the obstacles getting me to and from my room and to the elevator and you know just getting me around she did really good. Before I got my guide dog my hardest mobility challenges were just finding doors, finding buildings, trying to get from one place to another. The most important things Callie does is get me places easier. Sometimes I'm not quite sure where we're going but I know I'm gonna get there. <laughs> Everybody likes Callie. She's been a big impact at home. Uh, my wife loves her and I have to keep her away from her sometimes. <laughs> Just so that uh, I can spend more time with her. Pete and guide dog Chance have been together since November of 2014. Chance was Pete's first guide dog. He was matched with Pete in part because of his strength working in complicated urban settings and his great demeanor and concentration around kids. Went blind at the age of 13 with a detached retina. The family loves him, especially the children. They go crazy every time when he wakes up in the morning and they have to say goodnight. The guide dog really shined on a walk going to a shell store one day. Got to the corner to get ready to cross. I didn't hear a car coming. I assumed it was safe to cross. And next thing I know, I hear the car rev up and Chance just stops right in the middle of the street and waits for the car to pass. What it feels like to walk down the sidewalk with my guide dog, I, it's, it's real enjoyable. It's, I love it because with every walk, it's, it's faster pace. It's, it's a talk with him. Not only do I talk to him, I can tell him my thoughts, what I'm thinking, and can't believe I'm saying it every once in a while, I sing with him. The most important things my dog will do for me is keeping me safe when we're out and about in walks, crossing the streets, and making sure I get to where I need to go properly. Where I go with my guide dog, I go everywhere with him, to stores, church, to meetings, job interviews, just about everywhere. You've heard from a puppy raiser about how these amazing guide dogs have touched her and her family. You had a glimpse into a training session for a guide dog in advanced training with a certified guide dog mobility instructor. You saw a guide dog applicant navigate with a white cane and discuss the excitement of getting matched with his first guide dog. Finally, you heard from some of our recent graduates talking about how their lives were changed when they became part of a guide dog team. Since the filming of this video, Marshall, the gentleman you saw with a cane, has graduated with his guide dog, Duncan. Their journey together is just beginning. Guide Dogs of Texas is based in San Antonio, but our instructors live all over Texas. At Guide Dogs of Texas, clients don't have to travel out of state and live in a dorm in order to learn to use a guide dog. Our instructors will help them learn in their own community. Most instructors have at least one story about piloting a minivan up an unpaved road to someplace not even on a map somewhere in Texas because we had a team there that needed our help. The transition from a white cane to a guide dog opens up new possibilities for independence and mobility. Clients who travel, attend conferences, or go to school will find that new routes can be learned much more easily by a team than was ever possible when navigating alone with a cane. The handler and guide dog use their combined senses, knowledge, and problem-solving skills to provide a higher level to safety than ever before. The job of a guide dog is to provide greater independence and mobility, and this goal drives our client selection and training. 
Still, many clients find that the companionship of being part of a team enriches their lives in ways they never expected. At Guide Dogs of Texas, we feel that each guide dog applicant is unique. We honor that difference with the careful matching and individualized training for each guide dog and every team. We believe every guide dog, every volunteer, every sponsor, every staff member, and every guide dog team changes our community for the better every day. found it cool well good afternoon how are y'all how are y'all doing man well i am so happy to be here um my, my wife jack jackie and i over there we're we're so excited to be here today um before i start talking though i want to introduce my friend up here this is really the reason we're all here are the guide dogs but this is echo she's my guide dog oh my goodness she is amazing she's just incredible you know, whenever I first got her, though, I, I learned a few things about myself. One of the things that I learned, it kind of changed my perspective on everything, but one of the things I learned was that I no longer matter. It doesn't matter where I go. If I walk into a room and I have this cute little fuzzy face next to me, I, I might as well stay home. It doesn't matter. They just want echo. That's all that matters. <laughs> like the first month, I think, that I had her, well, I was walking down the road, and um, I heard, heard somebody yelled out. They said, well, hello, handsome. And I'll, I'll admit, like, my heart, like, like, it leapt up a little bit. I got kind of excited, and I turned around, and, of course, it wasn't me. They were, they were talking about it all, no. All Echo. It's always Echo. She does deserve it, though. And I have to brag about her. She was put in the Animal Hall of Fame this year, and isn't that, it's just incredible. And it's the training from the Guide Dogs of Texas, isn't that? <laughs> you know, I don't think it's gone to her head, either. She, has, she doesn't act any different than she did before it, but... She is just brilliant, but it is, it's a training from the Guide Dogs of Texas, and the work that we do, I'm an artist, we, um, on average, we fly about every two weeks, we, she's been on over 250 flights all over the country, outside of the country, and I've met Guide Dogs from everywhere, from different schools, and I'm not knocking any other schools, but I have definitive proof that this school is by far the best one. It's just incredible, the, the dogs that come out of here are just spectacular. They're amazing. The things they do, the way they act, the whole package is just, oh my goodness, it's just incredible. And as good as those dogs are, though, I know like whenever, whenever I was wondering about getting a guide dog, I was, I was weighing the pros and the cons and everything, so it's, it's not all brilliant. There are a few things about, about a guide dog. Like, one of the things, we do travel a lot, so it's like I've gained 80 extra pounds <laughs> with her. <laughs> So some of, the, some of the airplanes we get into are a little small, and by the end of it, she's, she's laying on me, I'm laying on her, and, and my legs have gone to sleep, her legs have gone to sleep, and we're both walking off the plane a little, a little, a little wobbly. So that, that, that gets to be a little funny. And sometimes if you have a visual impairment and you're at an airport, they always, if they know that there's somebody with a disability, they'll bring a wheelchair. And especially if they see you walk off the plane like that, and then they're like, do you want a wheelchair? And they're like, no. And they're like, are you sure? <laughs> But she is good. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, another thing. If you have a guide dog, they're brilliant. But forever after, every friend you have that has a dog every, everywhere you go, you're going to hear all these stories about, about, about their genius dog. You're like, they'll say, oh, 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 of course that goes smart. Of course they're smart. But my dog's a genius. And, of course, the entire time the dog's, like, chewing on the carpet, barking incessantly, <laughs> wetting all over the place. But, you know, it's a genius. So, yeah, that's something you have to learn to live with. Um, Oh, I'll share this, and maybe I shouldn't, but um, we, um, we went, like, maybe, I had Echo for maybe about two months, and we went to an orchestra, a symphony in the garden in Fort Worth, and it's an outdoor event, 
and they had these little porta potties. And I didn't realize that they, I'd always use a cane before Echo, and I didn't realize they had made these bigger porta potties. So I squeezed us into the well, little tiny one. And we're in there, and we're kind of bumping the sides. We're rocking that thing a little, and I'm, I'm knocking at her. I'm like, good girl, no bad girl. Ow, you're on my foot, and all this. And we're making all these different noises, and I'm talking to her. And then I didn't realize we had a little crowd building outside. So I open it up, and then they see her walk out, and they're like, oh, we wondered what was going on in there. So that's always nice. <laughs> but good times. You know, it's one of, one of the things, though, that surprised me. Um, I, I'm an artist. I, I paint, and I, I was an artist all my life. I drew ever since I was a little kid. Um, it made sense to my, my brain. For some reason, it clicked. And growing up, I had a lot of health problems. I had um, epilepsy from the time I was two. It developed into very severe epilepsy. I had kidney problems. I had a kidney out by the time I was seven. I ended up getting Lyme's disease. Um, then um, in, when I was a co in college, I ended up having some really bad seizures that caused my breathing to stop, my heart to stop, and I lost like 40% of my hearing and all of my vision. Um, I have a seven-year-old son now, and I have hearing aids, and my son says I have ro robot ears because I hear everything. <laughs> but growing up, though, you know, it, it, I, had, I had different things that I was dealing with, and the way that I dealt with it was through artwork. And it was a really good way to deal with a bad day. So if you have a bad day, you're not thinking about the things you lost. You're not worried about the future. You're only thinking about what it is that you're doing. And on a really good day, art turns out to be a great way to celebrate a good day. So every day, good or bad, I had artwork. And I had that all the way up until I lost my eyesight. And then I had this idea because, you know, I thought, well, to be a visual artist... You probably need vision. I mean, it's in the first word of the, the label, visual art. It kind of makes sense. Um, but then a wonderful thing happened. I, I was in school. I, was in, I stayed in. I was going to the University of North Texas, and I kept going to school there. I was afraid if I left, I wouldn't go back. So I ended up just getting a lot of incompletes and had a sighted guide that would take me to class. And that whole first year, I was learning O&M. I was learning all these different techniques. But the big thing was I was learning how to use my sense of touch to do everything, well, I guess like to adapt. For everything that I use my eyes for, I was starting to use touch for. So, and after about a year, I was able to leave my apartment and find the campus, then find the right building on the campus, the right class in the right building on the campus, and the right seat in the right class in the right building. And I thought, well, my goodness, if I could do this and basically feel my way across town, without knocking down too many people or getting hit by a car or anything embarrassing like that, then surely I could navigate across something that, that was a little bit infinitely smaller and potentially had a lot more meaning. So I thought, and that's what got me back into artwork, just using the same techniques that I use with the cane to be able to look for physical landmarks. Because whenever I travel with Echo or a cane, I'm looking for like corners, I'm looking for trees, fire plugs, things that they don't move around or anything. So. I find those things, and it's the same way with my paintings when I draw. And I draw with lines that I can feel. So if you're a sighted artist, of course, you'll make a line, and then you'll check the line with your eyes, and you'll think, well, is that a good line or is that a bad line? If you're a non-visual artist, you'll make the line, but then you'll check it with your hands, and you'll think, is it a good line, is it a bad line? The wonderful thing, though, is whenever I got Echo, it opened up art for me in such a huge way. It opened up everything for me, really. I mean, it's just incredible. Having Echo, having a guide dog like Echo, it makes me a better, I think it makes me a better husband. It makes me a better dad. It's, it's just incredible. I, I, can, I can go to, a, I can take my son to a playground, and he can go play, and then even if I can't hear him, I can ask Echo, say, hey, hey Echo, can you, can you find Jack? And then we'll go over and we'll go to Jack. We'll find him. Or we can be in a store. We can do all these different things that, People are just so used to doing, they take for granted, and things that I didn't think I would be able to do. With Echo, we travel so much. We work with museums all over the place. We, it's usually just me and her traveling. Today, I'm fortunate to have my wife, but it's usually just us. And traveling used to make me very nervous when I had to go places, because I just had a stick. I had a cane, you know, and, and she's much more fun to travel with than a stick, I'll tell you. And... <laughs> Oh, here's my favorite thing. And I don't know if, I don't know if all of you know this. You probably do. But, um, 
the guide dogs now can tell the difference between a men's bathroom and a ladies' bathroom. Did, did everybody know that? No, some, well, it's awesome. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's brilliant. It is my favorite, favorite thing, and she's a genius. But, you know, if you're a guy, it's not cool to go into another a men's room and start touching other guys, even with a stick. <laughs> you know, I'm just feeling around and just starting to see him. So, not cool. But with her, if we're in an airport somewhere, and I ask her to find the boys' room, you know, I'll say, Echo, find, find the boys. She'll find it even if it's gates and gates away. Like, she'll find the best way to get there. Once you're in there, she knows the difference between a stall, a urinal. She knows how to find the sink. She knows how to try to find the trash can, find the door again. If you're in one of these places, it's like a coliseum where they might have sinks in a separate room and, you know, everything's all separated. Or if you're in a gym that's like that. If you've never been in there, trying to find just the sink can, can be, take a while, especially if it's crowded. And, you know, as I say, it can be very, very embarrassing. <laughs> And with a stick, sometimes you can walk into the wrong bathroom. I don't know how many ladies' bathrooms I've been in. And I have no idea. How, do you, how are they so clean? I don't understand that either. That's just, we are really being shafted, guys, because those, those bathrooms are much nicer. And, but with her, that doesn't happen anymore. And then after, like, after, if you're in an airport, let's say, and you want to find your way back to your seat, She'll find the way back, and she'll find the best way back. So if traffic patterns have changed, you know, if, if people are moving around, there's carts going, all this stuff, she'll find the best way to find your seat, and she'll take you right to the exact seat that you were sitting, even if there's someone sitting there now. <laughs> and she'll put their nose right in the, in the... There was one trip, I think, to Albuquerque, and there was a guy reading a newspaper, and, of course, her head comes right up <laughs> underneath the newspaper. <laughs> so I've made some very, very quick friends. <laughs> but... She, she is brilliant. And it's just, you know, it's incredible, though, I think. And I, I feel so lucky to be born in the place where I am, in the state that I am that has, has this organization here. And also in the time that I am. You know, I'm, I'm a visual artist, and this is the first time in history when artists who are blind are getting into painting. You know, so if you were going to make a flow chart, some sort of homework assignment, and you're going to make a list of all the artists who were blind who got into painting. It'd be the easiest thing in the world because there aren't any until now. There have been painters in the past who, whose vision has started to go, like Monet, for instance. And they've come up with, with adaptations and techniques to be able to keep producing art. But this is the first time in history where people who are visually impaired are able to do that. And it's just, you know, it's... I just think about that some point, you know, every once in a while, I mean, after thousands and thousands of years, we're at the crossing roads now where people with visual impairments are able to do more than they ever have. And there's no ceiling anymore. It's just incredible. You know, the, the screen readers that we have, the ability to read books, really to do, read something like for artwork. Well, let me tell you, in artwork, there aren't a lot of books on Braille and how to paint. Imagine that. It's hard to find a visual arts on the intricacies of shadow and Braille. You, know, it's, you, don't, you don't really find it. But with the computers we have now, it's incredible. You can read anything. If it was a book written 200 years ago, or if it was a Facebook post two seconds ago, with a smart dog and a smartphone, you can pretty much go anywhere and do anything. It's just a wonderful, wonderful time to be alive. And the interesting thing that I had, I had no idea about this, it just snuck up on me, but whenever I first started getting back into art, I always thought it might be a second-hand way of doing art. I didn't know how far I could go. I, I thought I was crazy. I didn't tell people that I was painting. I had a little white dog at the time, and I would paint. I didn't realize how much paint really stuck to you. So the little white dog would come over, and I'd say, oh, you're so cute, and I'd pet her and pet her. And friends would come over and say, what happened to Anne? She's all purple and orange. And, and, I, like, and I wouldn't tell people I was painting because I didn't want them to think I was crazy. So I was like, I don't know. I, she just gets into stuff, I guess. <laughs> it's, Poor little thing. But she got so much attention, I think she liked it. <laughs> but in the first shows I did, I didn't tell people I was blind. I didn't want people to think about that. It was just, you know, sort of a, a so I, I wouldn't have a show opening. I'd have a closing. And, and after a while, that, that began to change. But it's just incredible, though, in just an, a matter of years, how fast things have changed, how much things have progressed for people with visual impairments and really any disability. It's just um, it's just such an incredible, incredible time to be alive. One of the things that I find amazing about Echo, too, is that she's part of the family. And I want to thank everyone here that's supporting Guide Dogs of Texas because your support, everything that you're doing, it's made my family grow. I have a new family member. It's made me 
it's made it possible for me to be a better dad, a better husband. And it's incredible the amount of trust, though, that you have with a guide dog. Like I said, we've been all over. We've been in subways, trams. Um, oh, my goodness. Just every, every kind of device you could think of that you could travel on, we've been in. Um, we've been to the Grand Canyon. I wanted to do some landscape painting and figured there was some out there. So, so we went to the Grand Canyon. I wasn't sure if I'd like it, actually, because the Grand Canyon's a hole. So it's not really anything there, and I can't see it anyway. So I'm going to not look at something that isn't there. And so... <laughs> And, um, but it was awesome. You could hear the wind going in all the canyons. And it was just amazing, amazing. And Echo, even though it's about a mile deep, she just treated it like it was a normal curb. So she walked me right up to the south rim and just stopped right on the edge. <laughs> and my family was like, they're all off looking at something else or whatever. They're looking like, don't go forward, <laughs> whatever you do. <laughs> so I thought, oh, okay, well. But it's just, you know, it's funny, though, but it wasn't scary because she's not going to let me take that step, you know. But um, even on stairs, like she swings her head around. She can tell when I'm not paying attention, which is most of the time. So if we're, if we're heading towards stairs, so she'll, she'll bump me with her head like, hey, wake up. <laughs> and it's just, it's just wonderful. It's just incredible. One of the things, though, about the visual art that surprised me is that, you know, I said that I always thought it would be a secondhand way of doing things. I wasn't really sure. One of the wonderful things is that visual artists have been thinking about the visual world for centuries and coming up with really simple ways to understand it and to be able to convey that understanding to other people. So if a visual artist two, three hundred years ago in England wanted to describe a painting to someone, he would, he, would, he would write down, he had all these little ways to do it, to break down the composition, then he, he could write it in a letter and send it to someone else. The wonderful thing is that these ways of breaking down the visual world apply directly to someone who's visually impaired. There's so many different techniques that makes O&M so much better. And this was sort of a shock. I had no idea. It's just incredible that the perspective that you have, have as a, a visual impaired person is different. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily worse. It's just different. Um, and thank goodness for all of this and the modern O&M techniques. The way that I can tell the way a person looks like, I do a lot of portrait work, but I feel their face. But it's a way that visual artists have been breaking down compositions for centuries. And I combine that with modern O&M techniques to be able to break down a person's face and do it in little chunks, little chunks, sort of a mnemonic device. And it sounds hard, but it's really easy. But it made it, though, so whenever my son was born, I was able to feel his face right when he was born. And what a gift that was, to be able to actually understand what he looks like. You know, and it just, oh my goodness, it just, it, I, I, it's hard to explain what that means. It's just, you know, it's, it's, just, it, it's just totally incredible to me what having Echo has done for us. It's just, you know, I, I <coughs> pardon me. It, it's, oh my goodness, it's just, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to explain. It's hard to put into words, really, and I think that's one reason I paint, is because it's hard to ar articulate some of these feelings that I have, some of these ideas. But I know in my artwork, I, I can tell a change. I've had Echo for seven years. My paintings used to be very dark very simple sort of things, very, like very geometric. And over the last seven years, they keep getting brighter and brighter. I'm happier and happier. And you can see the joy, and it's coming out in the artwork. And it's gotten to the point where the paints aren't enough. Like, the, I, get, like I want to put batteries in the paint, and, you know, just to make them glow, to make them, you know, hook, you know, plug them in the wall somehow. And I've started working with these, these UV reactive paints now because it's not enough for paint, for light just to bounce off you know, the painting, it needs to react with it and glow because inside I feel like I'm glowing. I just, you know, I feel happier than I ever have in my life. And if you would have told me that in 2001 whenever I lost my eyesight, I would not have believed you. In fact, people did tell me. Um, Ron Venable, he's the president of the university that I went to, and I was assigned up at the Office of Disability for epilepsy, and I went and talked to him and said, well, Ron, you know, it looks like I'm losing my eyesight, so I'm going to have to leave school. He was like, oh, John, you're crazy. You don't have to leave school. There's all kinds of things we can do. You know, there's all sorts of techniques, and you, you know, you'd be surprised what's out there. And I thought he was so nice to lie to me like that, and to, to take the time to lie. And, but he was so right. And it, was just, it was just incredible. And I can't imagine going back to a cane. You know, I have a wonderful family. I have this amazing support system. Growing up when I was sick a lot, and I was in the hospitals, I was on wards, I always had an amazing family, but I felt isolated, and especially whenever I lost my eyesight, 
I felt very isolated, extremely alone. Well, for the last seven years with Echo, I'm never alone. Sometimes I kind of wish I could get alone, maybe for a minute. Like, just for a minute, girl. But she is always there. I always have a best friend that's always looking out for the, for the best in me and just loves me unconditionally. So in the last seven years, never had a moment where there wasn't somebody right there that's just loving me and looking out for me. And that's what it feels like to have a guide dog from the guide dogs of Texas. It's just the best feeling in the world. But I want to thank everybody for being here and letting me talk about Echo for a while. And, and I want to encourage you, if anybody in here wants to feel the paintings outside that I have out there, you're not going to hurt them. Feel them, touch them if you want to. Um, if you do hurt them, I can fix them. So it's no, it's no bother. I know the artist. We, we, we can make it right. Um, but I want to thank you so much for having me here today and for having Echo and for supporting Guide Dogs. You guys are amazing. Thank you.